<laughs> there's nothing in there that I could argue about. Uh, they asked me to do a couple, three things today. So what I'm going to do first is to introduce my bride of almost 60 years, Sharon. Honey. And you all know John and his wife. John, you're younger, so he's the younger kid. So. <laughs> One thing. Uh, we went, when we came here in 1946, our class was mostly combat veterans from World War II. A few who were not uh, blended in well. But this group of people who came here at that time were different than your ages now. These are the best years of your life. Let me repeat that. These are the best years of your life. You're experiencing something now, you really don't understand what's happening. But in a few years, you will look back and say, hey, yeah, Fisa did that. I enjoyed that. You heard what they said. Back then, as I started to say, a combat veteran had a different perception. They had been there. I used to be a smart ass when I was young. <laughs> Uh, I was essentially brought up by myself. I lived with a variety of people as I grew up. I did not have the kind of home that my wife had made for uh, me and uh, our six kids. I was a wanderer. I was constantly in trouble. I quit high school when I was 16 and lied about my age and joined the Navy. The first mortar on Iwo Jima took the smart ass right out of me. First mortar made me no longer a smart ass. Somewhere in there I realized that there's something different. Now keep in mind, I only had three months of high school. I got out safe, the Lord was with me. I walked away without a scratch. When hundreds of my comrades and friends died around me, there was something special in that message. So I was able to, through GED tests and the, the gracious <coughs> activities of the few ex-professors who gave me credits that I did not earn or deserve, I was able to get in Valpo. One of the main reasons was they needed GI money. The university was in trouble then. They needed that GI bill. So 750 combat GIs it invaded this campus. A Lutheran University, young Lutheran girls. <laughs> Very different. You bring together that many guys who have been there, who have seen death, there's not much you can tell them to get to their soul. They've seen it. They've seen and been with people who died. They have a different perspective. They came here for two reasons. Because it was free, unquote, quote, unquote, and because they wanted to better themselves and get an education. Education? I didn't even know what an education was. I never had math. Never had math. I got in. First year I got all that. They needed the money so they let me continue. I joined Fisai only because I was kind of a rah-rah guy and got along with a lot of guys and I had had my share of combat with the guys, other guys, so we got in together. And it was different because I had never had that community feeling, that spirit of brotherhood and comradeship. <clears throat> All of a sudden it came to pass. Likewise for a lot of these other guys who had been essentially on their own for the last few years in war. One thing they learned was the value of a friend and brotherhood. You had to depend on the guy next to you. You just had to. We came here, Drew, whenever I'm, you want me to get out of here, raise your hand. It works. Okay. Oh, here he is. 
I wish I had time to tell you the stories of the kind of things that we used to do. <laughs> <laughs> we had beer in the house, we had a beer keg all the time, 24 hours. I see the grin, that's not going to happen anymore, guys. <laughs> uh, but it was uh, very interesting. One of the, one of the uh, uh, pictures in that thing was a bonfire. Well, Johnny remember this. Uh, the freshmen would build a bonfire and then, uh, then they had a protector. So we built a bonfire to be all bonfires. We had engineers, major engineers, we had, we had the biggest damn bonfire you ever saw. Second year, it was our turn to try to uh, <clears throat> burn the bonfire down for those who had followed us. We set up the biggest war strategy and war plan you could have seen. <laughs> that bonfire lasted 15 minutes. <laughs> we chased all the underclassmen into their houses and it burned down. Then he had to build another one. <laughs> My impact really came after I got out of here. I went on to Northwestern where I met Sharon. And uh, uh, I lived in a Tefaisai house at Northwestern, even though they were Kappa and I was Delta. And as I traveled on business, I went to Illinois, stayed there. Went to Purdue, uh, went to DuPaul, and as I came to these places, there was something very similar in the guys and the attitudes. And it came to me, why don't we have that U.S. and global thing at Galpo? So that we can share and they can share with us. So our guys will have an extended brotherhood. They have the same principles and character that they have. So I started to think about that, and I came down, this was three years after I got out, and sat down with the president of the university. Talked to him, and I said, hey, you want to grow? You want to be national? You want to have a lot of people come here? How about national fraternities on campus? Oh, no. We ain't going to have any of that. Remember OP? Yeah. Harry, you're never going to have that. I didn't give up. Five months later, after nine visits, he finally said, well, let's see about it. So what I did is I called Fiside Cole, told him I wanted someone from their executive office to come down and talk to the president, which he did. And the process that we went through at the GAC was very interesting. They called me the founder, but that's a misnomer. Everybody in that class at that time was a founder because they all helped found this place. In action, brotherhood in action. Now keep in mind, this was the first for Belgium, a national organization like this. Uh, we had a strategy, fortunately, we had Dean Moreland, Dean of the Law School, as our advisor. So guess who became the front man? We put the dean out front. We had excellent professors who participated. Uh, we found out that we sent members to various chapters in the fourth district. So they got to know them. Some of them got to know us. Uh, we found out all about the GAC and what went on there and how you registered and how all the people coming registered. And we got their names in advance and we memorized the names. <coughs> for the two guys from every chapter. So when they came to the registration desk and gave us their name, the guy sitting at the desk, John, remember this, the guy sitting at the desk said, oh, you're Drew, you're from Valpo. Well, whoa, who are these guys? Long story short, it was unanimous, we got in, bang, and there it started. Uh, it's nice to be connected to the five sides of today. Um, I have to thank you at the bottom of my heart because you're a realization of one of my dreams to see a group of young people who in these times with all the drugs and booze and narcotics and homosexuality and all the other steps going around in the world 
that here are 36, 37 guys dedicated to something far better than that. Back to what I said earlier, when you get out of here, you're going to start to realize that. I guarantee that will happen. Another thing I want you to know right now, you're not going to be in touch with all these people here down the line. You're going to be in touch with a few, but they're going to be inside you because of the examples, because of what you stand for, because of the service. I don't have to tell you guys about service or convention. You know what it feels like to walk and give to others when you're doing it. You know the fun you have. You know the after effect. You don't take pleasure in serving. It's you who gets served. You're the one in game. Believe me, guys, when you become men and married and honorable with your wife, you'll never, ever regret that you belong to my side. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me.